नमस्ते सर्वदेवाना वरदासी हरि the sacred journey of shri aurobindo's life a walk through the life of shri aurobindo shri aurobindo is an emanation of the supreme who came on earth to announce the manifestation of a new race and a new world the supramental let us prepare for it in all sincerity and eagerness the mother shri aurobindo an eternal birth in calcutta on the 15th of august 1872 a son was born to dr krishnadhan ghosh and swarnalata devi his name was aurobindo which means lotus in sanskrit early life in 1877 shri aurobindo was sent to an english medium boarding school loretta house darjeeling in 1879 dr ghosh and his family sailed for england so that his children could receive an entirely european upbringing he left them under the care of reverend druitt with the understanding that his children would not be exposed to indian culture in sri aurobindo's own words they grew up in entire ignorance of india her people her religion and her culture in england in 1884 Shri Aurobindo joined St Paul's School in London where he learned English literature and poetry along with Greek and Latin. In 1889 Shri Aurobindo passed a competitive exam and enrolled as a probationer for 2 years which was the requirement for joining the Indian Civil Service. The Indian Civil Services was the British equivalent for the indian administrative services of today he secured a scholarship at king's college in cambridge university the school had master remarked of all the boys who passed through my hands during the last 25 or 30 years orobindo was by far the most richly endowed with intellectual capacity While at Cambridge Sri Aurobindo developed the nationalist feeling for his motherland and joined the Indian Majlis an organization for Indian students in Britain at Baroda At this time the Maharaja of Baroda Sayaji Rai Gaikwad the 3rd was in England and invited Sri Aurobindo to join his Baroda state service Sri Aurobindo left for India in February 1893. He was just over 20 years of age. When he landed in India, a darkness that had been hovering above left him and a sense of calmness pervaded everywhere around him. In Baroda, Sri Aurobindo joined the state service in various departments and by the year 1895, he held a position in the office of the Diwan. Secretariat of Gaikwad from 1898 onward he also started to teach at the Baroda College later on he became the vice principal there he was a voracious reader and assimilated the spirit of indian civilization its forms past and present so you met aurobindo ghosh did you notice his eyes there is a mystic fire and light in them they penetrate into the beyond the principal of the baroda college his quest shri aurobindo traveled to bengal frequently and established his relations with his family in 1901 at the age of 28 shri aurobindo married brinalini devi 
He once wrote to his wife, I have three madnesses. Firstly, it is my firm faith that all the virtue, talent, the higher education and knowledge and the wealth God has given me belong to him. The second madness has recently taken hold of me. It is this, by any means I must have the direct experience of God. The third madness is this, whereas others regard the country as an inert piece of matter and know it as the plains, the fields, the forests, the mountains and the rivers. I know my country as the mother. I worship her and adore her accordingly. Bhavani Mandir It was around the beginning of 1905 that Sri Aurobindo wrote the famous revolutionary booklet Bhavani Mandir. A temple is to be erected and consecrated to Bhavani, the mother among the hills. To all the children of the mother, the call is sent forth to help in the sacred work. Sri Aurobindo and the momentous times in Indian history from 1906 to 1910. July 1905, July 1906, Partition of Bengal. Beginning of Sri Aurobindo's participation in Bengal and national politics. While in Baroda, he started taking interest in India's political struggle for independence against the British Raj. He made contact with Lokmanya Tilak and sister Nivedita. He also arranged for military training for a person and sent him to organize resistant groups in Bengal. He formally moved to Bengal in 1906 after the partition of Bengal. In 1906, on his 34th birthday, Sri Aurobindo was appointed principal of the National College, Calcutta. He also started to write articles in a provocatively named newspaper, Bande Mataram. Later, his brother started a paper named Jugantar, wherein Sri Aurobindo actively participated in writing, editing and printing. Both the publications were under the suspicious eye of the Britishers and were raided by the police. September 1907, April 1908 In December 1907 in Surat, the National Indian Congress was split and Sri Aurobindo, along with Lokmanya Tilak, Lala Lajpat Rai and Bipin Chandrapal formed the Nationalist Party. His public speeches and articles in Bande Mataram made him a pacemaker and a tone setter of the movement of India's freedom. Sri Aurobindo, being active in politics, travelled across the country, attending numerous meetings and delivering speeches. He would explain in his speeches that nationalism was not merely a program but the Sanatana Dharma, a religion that is universal and eternal. National education, Swadeshi or boycott, were not anything by themselves. They would have to be lived by the people so that the Spirit of God could work on the nation. May 1908, May 1909 In 1908, a young boy of 16 years, Khudiram, was sent to the gallows as a punishment for an attempted assassination of a magistrate. Sri Aurobindo was one of the main suspects and on the 7th May 1908, he was arrested. He was subjected to solitary confinement for a year in Alipur jail in Calcutta. The case of Sri Aurobindo, commonly referred to as the Alipur bomb case, lasted for a year and he was acquitted in May 1909 for lack of evidence. My appeal to you is this. 
that long after this controversy will be hushed in silence, long after this turmoil, this agitation ceases, long after he is dead and gone, he will be looked upon as the poet of patriotism, as the prophet of nationalism and the lover of humanity. Long after he is dead and gone, his words will be echoed and re-echoed not only in India, but across distant seas and lands. Therefore I say that the man in his position is not only standing before the bar of this court, but before the bar of the High Court of History. An extract from the speech of Chitaranjan Das, Sri Aurobindo's Defence Council. Sri Aurobindo later recounted that he took the prison as an ashram where he meditated and practiced his yoga. And in the cell, he heard the voice of God guiding him. The bonds you had not strength to break, I have broken for you, because it is not my will, nor was it ever my intention, that that should continue. I have another thing for you to do, and it is for that I have brought you here to teach you what you could not learn for yourself and to train you for my work. Sri Aurobindo's Karma Yogin Uttarpara speech. In the jail he realized the one in all he recalled in his Uttarpara speech. I looked and it was not the magistrate whom I saw. It was Vasudeva. It was Narayana who was sitting there on the bench. I looked at the prosecuting counsel and it was not the counsel for the prosecution that I saw. It was Sri Krishna who sat there. It was my lover and friend who sat there and smiled. Now do you fear, he said. I am in all men and I overrule their actions and their words. My protection is still with you and you shall not fear. This case which is brought against you, leave it in my hands. It is not for you. It is not for the trial that I brought you here, but for something else. The case itself is only a means for my work and nothing more. In 1909, Sri Aurobindo prophesied, Since 1907, we are living in an era which is full of hope for India. Not only India, but the whole world will see sudden upheavals and revolutionary changes. The high will become low and the low high. The oppressed and the depressed shall be elevated. The nation and humanity will be animated by a new consciousness, new thought, and new efforts will be able to reach new ends. Amidst these revolutionary changes, India will become free. Nirod Bharan, Sri Aurobindo for all ages. At the beginning of 1910, Sri Aurobindo received a divine instruction to withdraw from political activities and go to Chandranagar a township near Calcutta under the French administration. Following another Adesh, from there he departed to south of India, to Pondicherry, which was also under the French rule. Sri Aurobindo voyaged to Pondicherry in a steamship, the duplex, which reached on April 4, 1910. While Sri Aurobindo was living an austere life in Pondicherry, he was extensively writing, corresponding with disciples and also balancing a shoestring budget. While into all this, he exemplified what he wrote later in the synthesis of yoga. The true and full object and utility of yoga can only be accomplished when the conscious yoga in man becomes like the conscious yoga in nature, outwardly conterminous with life itself 
and we can once more, looking out both on the path and the achievement, say in a more perfect and luminous sense, all life is yoga. Arya Mira Alfasa, who came to be known as the mother, met Sri Aurobindo for the first time on March 29, 1914. Sri Aurobindo, along with Meera, started a monthly review, Arya, on August 15, 1914, which lasted till January 1921. It serialized various themes, which were later compiled in seven books. Our idea of Arya was the thinking out of a synthetic philosophy, which might be a contribution to the thought of the new age that is coming upon us. We start from the idea that humanity is moving to a great change of its life, which will even lead to a new life of the race. In all countries where men think there is now in various forms that idea and that hope, and our aim has been to search for the spiritual, religious and other truth which can enlighten and guide the race in this movement and endeavor. Sri Aurobindo wrote, The principle of the integral yoga is not perfection of the human nature as it is, but a psychic and spiritual transformation of all the parts of the being through the action of an inner consciousness and then of a higher consciousness which works on them, throws their old movements or changes them into images of its own and so transmutes lower into higher nature. In 1920, Mira Alfasa, the mother, returned to Pondicherry to be with Sri Aurobindo. She would later become Sri Aurobindo's spiritual collaborator and continue his work. All my realizations, Nirvana and others, would have remained theoretical, as it were, so far as the outer world was concerned. It is the mother who showed the way to a practical form. Without her, no organized manifestation would have been possible. Sri Aurobindo's reply to Nirod Bharan, the foundation of the ashram. After 1926, the Sri Aurobindo ashram officially began and gradually the mother took charge of the sadhana of the disciples. She was accepted as the mother and was the very embodiment of grace, purity, love and compassion. The day of Siddhi November 24th, 1926. On 24th November 1926, after the descent of the overmind in the physical, Sri Aurobindo withdrew into solitude in order to prepare and hasten the descent of the supermind. Sri Aurobindo's symbol explained by the mother. The descending triangle represents Sat, Chit, Ananda. The ascending triangle represents the aspiring answer from matter under the form of life, light and love. The junction of both the central square is the perfect manifestation having at its center the avatar of the supreme, the lotus. The water inside the square represents the multiplicity the creation. The Gnostic being Sri Aurobindo envisioned Man is a transitional being. He is not final. Nature has not brought out in man her highest possibilities. She has not reached in him the supreme heights of consciousness and being. As there was before him the infrahuman the insect and animal, so there shall be after him the superhuman, the superman. Man may himself become the superman 
but for that he must exceed himself. It is not by clinging to his present imperfect consciousness that he can take the next step in the evolution. He must discover and release the spiritual Godhead within him. Realize his divine possibilities. Be himself the giant potential something. The divine someone who has been struggling into emergence out of the original plasm that imprisoned it since began the mystery of terrestrial nature. The manifestation of the supramental upon earth is no more a promise but a living fact, a reality. It is at work here and one day will come when the most blind, the most unconscious, even the most unwilling shall be obliged to recognize it. The Mother, 24th April, 1956 Never for an instant vacillate in the belief that the mighty work of change taken by Sri Aurobindo is going to culminate in success. For that, indeed, is a fact. There is not a shadow of doubt as to the issue of the work we have in hand. The transformation is going to be. Nothing will stop it. Nothing will frustrate the decree of the Omnipotent, the Mother. <laughs>